And welcome to the Bandit Room. My name is Charles, and I'm joined here in the studio today by Mr. Caleb. Hello. Mr. Aggie. What's up? And our very special guest today, Representative Gary Simrall. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, to all the guests who may not be familiar with Gary, you are the representative for the South Carolina House District 46. You've been in office since 1992, uh, served as the majority leader of the South Carolina House, as well as the chair of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, am I getting anything wrong so far? So far, you're right on it. <laughs> <laughs> and you are the outgoing uh, representative. Is that right? How many... you're, you're correct about that as well. <laughs> How many days left? Uh, November 15th is probably the drop dead date, so gotcha. a little less than a month. All right. All right. So coming to a close here on your 30 years in politics, what, what's, uh, what's been some of your favorite or most memorable legislation that are things that you worked on while you've been in office well and, and I received an award uh, in in Columbia from the Riley Institute at Furman University and, and it was a prestigious award one that I didn't think I deserved and wouldn't have nominated myself but they asked the question about memorable legislation something that was poignant in your career and right behind you is <laughs> is what that was and and it the fact that the boiled peanut is the official state snack food of South Carolina. <laughs> right on. And somebody says, no, wait a minute, tell me this again. Uh-huh. And so I had a constituent who called me and said, hey, I was looking at the South Carolina history books, and, mm-hmm. and we don't have, we have a state beverage, we have a state bird, we have a state fish, we have a state rock, uh-huh. but we don't have an official state snack food. Hmm. Unbeknownst to me, he said, it should be the boiled peanut. <laughs> I said, no problem. So I introduced this piece of legislation, which you would think not only comical in nature, but couldn't be controversial, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, some people have peanut allergies. Oh. So this became controversial. And so someone wanted to change the boiled peanut as the official state snack food to the pork rind. Mm. So now we've got a worthy peanuts. opponent. <laughs> worthy, a worthy opponent. However, I had a, a Jewish member mm-hmm. of the General Assembly said, "Hey, oh. that's not oh, culture. That's, that's right. That's that's right. right. So more yeah. controversy. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, the the bowl peanut won out, and I was at my desk in Rock Hill. Phone rings, and it's our governor at the time, Mark Sanford. And Governor Sanford says, "Hey, I want to come to Rock Hill and sign this piece of legislation." And I said, Governor, you do know it's the boiled peanut pill. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I absolutely know that. It's not about the bill. It's not about the boiled peanut. It's about the process. It's about the process of a constituent calling a lawmaker, the representative, the representative acting, and that action becoming a law. And he said, that's what I want to celebrate. And so we went to... Uh, Bynum Poe's place on uh, South Cherry Road, Farmer's Exchange, Mm -hmm. and Bynum had a big pot Mm -hmm. of boiled peanuts. The governor came in, signed the bill, and the rest, as they say, is history. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That's fantastic. Well, that's awesome. And just for the occasion, we do have boiled peanuts in the the room here for you. Charles told me about it yesterday. I'm a big (laughs) boiled peanut fan, Cajun boiled peanut. My peanut man, he has a little... Shack over there of uh, India Hook and Mount Gallant. Mm-hmm. I, I buy from him all. Yep, yep. <clears throat> so, but I buy, buy that the day I want to drink a good bourbon with some boiled peanut, the perfect combination. <laughs> uh, so Charles was telling me he was going to surprise you by uh, bringing some boiled peanuts. But I asked him, can you make sure the peanuts are from South Carolina and not Georgia? <laughs> And he said he didn't think about it, but he already bought the peanuts. <laughs> so, Charles, did you go back and do any investigation on that? I'm afraid these are not South Carolina <laughs> peanuts. <laughs> they are in the Carolinas, though. That's a North Carolina peanut. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. And, and Aggie, interestingly enough, if you look at, at most cans of peanuts, mm-hmm. even if they say Virginia peanuts, mm-hmm. in most cases, it's a South Carolina Wow, peanut. okay. <laughs> huh. So, well, before we get into the next subject, what, what made you get into politics? That's an interesting question, too. I always liked politics. I didn't know that I would want to be the one in office, but it was 1980. Uh, Ronald Reagan was running for office. Uh, I was excited to um, join his campaign, Hmm. and so I volunteered. 14 years old, you can't vote, so, you know, 
really, what can you do other than be the cheerleader? <laughs> well, I met so many interesting people at age 14 uh, in the Ronald Reagan campaign, and it was an exciting youthful movement. I was 14 years old, but many, many teenagers were involved in, mm. in his campaign, although at the time he was one of the oldest men to ever run for office. So you had this this age <laughs> divide that really didn't matter. It was more about the country. It was more about policy. Well, 1984 comes, and of course he was successful in 1980. 1984 comes. First year I could vote. I was born in 66, so I could vote in 1984. Signed up again for the Ronald Reagan re-election campaign. Well, by this time, I could not only vote, but I could drive. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to traverse the state a lot more for Ronald Reagan and ended up meeting uh, many of Governor Campbell, who was then a congressman from the 4th Congressional District, Carol Campbell, met him and a lot of his staff. And so that really parlayed itself into me getting involved in his 1986 gubernatorial campaign in South Carolina, which was successful as well. Mm -hmm. And so the people that I met there, we had a, a great bond, a great relationship. And so in 1990, I went, started college in 1984 as well, uh, paid my way through college, so it took me a little extra time to get through. I graduated in, in May of 1991. Incidentally, Wes Hayes was the representative from this area. John Hayes, no relation to Wes, mm -hmm. was in the Senate. And John became a judge, which opened up that Senate seat in York County. Wes Hayes ran for that Senate seat. I decided to run at 24 years old for <laughs> Wes Hayes' House seat. <coughs> so I was the only Republican. And as I ran, people said to me, look, you shouldn't do this. You're in too inexperienced. You're too young. And you're a Republican. Yeah. I mean, three strikes. <laughs> so, so you can't win. Two Democrats announced. So they had a primary. I was not involved in the primary because I was the only, you know, one crazy enough to run from that Republican <laughs> side. And they were right. True to form, Aggie, I lost. Okay. Uh, but I didn't lose by a large amount, and it was a special election. And so, you know, I guess the worst thing that, that can happen to you is to be thought of as a loser versus being proved to be one. Mm -hmm. And so now I've, I've been publicly repudiated, <laughs> and I'm a young guy, and I thought, you know, this is uh, a little tough, but I'm going to go for it again. Yeah. And so I thought, if you're a one-time loser, being a two-time loser isn't that bad. <laughs> uh, at least you have a shot. And, and ironically, I won that race. And that was when Bill Clinton, Ross Perot, and George H.W. Bush were on the ballot in 1992. Mm -hmm. So I won uh, that race for Rock Hill, Rock Hill House District 46. And as they say it again, uh, that's history. Uh, Thirty years later, I mean, I've, again, if you if you had polled me, or wagered me, probably would have come close, but not have won. I did win. If you'd have said you would serve thirty years in the General Assembly, I would not have believed. Right, <laughs> right. It was it was not a master plan. Gotcha. Right. So, was there any other second master plan to whatever is the next thing, running for governor or running for U.S. Congress? Uh, did you ever think about that? Interesting question there too. Yes, when I was young and I got that first rung of a win uh, in 1992, I planned my steps. So, House, Senate. U.S. Congress governor. Hmm. The more I started working in the House of Representatives, I realized I did not want to be in the Senate hmm. of South Carolina. Hmm. The House was much more active uh, in how they went about things. When I went to the Senate, I thought it was like going into a funeral home. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they said, which family are you here for? Right. And, <laughs> and I, did, I, never, I never got the warm fuzzy that that was a place I wanted to be, so that scrapped that one. Uh -huh. uh, the thought of going to Washington, D.C. never intrigued me. Uh, the governor part intrigued me, but I had learned to represent my community. Mm. And within the House... It's really, it's not party. Um, it is relationships. It's connectivity. It's respect. And so as a, as a younger person in the body, elected at, at 25, I knew that I didn't know what my colleagues knew. I mean, mm. I was a younger guy. Obviously, they had more experience. And so I listened a lot more than I talked. 
and I developed relationships and I learned to become effective. And it's interesting in politics today, you know, I said in the pool of life, there are swimmers Hmm. and there are splashers. Hmm. The media covers the splashers because they make the most turbulence. Right. But Hmm. it's the swimmer that's actually going somewhere. Right. They're lapping the pool. Right. And I decided I wanted to be a swimmer and not a splasher. And so for my community, I was able to work within the confines of the political process, which, as you know, is not necessarily a paint-by-numbers series. You you have to really understand the dynamics of what makes it work. And so that's what led me to continue to serve because I recognized things that, that I was able to do in helping someone cut through red tape oil peanuts, mm-hmm. what, whatever mm-hmm. the case would be where, right. where you were a conduit for success right. for someone else. And I remember a time a family called me distraught. Uh, they had a, a child that was taken from them, put in foster care. Yeah. You know, again, the court system had to be involved in this. But once all that was adjudicated, they still were at a loss. And this child was being moved away. And I was able to step in and get a remedy for them and I remember looking at them and being reunited with their child the 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 look on their they talk about things that are priceless Mm -hmm. the look on their face and I thought you know not not that it was me but they call me I became a conduit right Mm -hmm. for that Mm -hmm. and so those are when somebody says what's what's the most successful attribute you know you can think of or what, what have you accomplished and it's those things that it's not going to be in the newspaper. Right. They're not going to publicize it. I'm not going to publicize it. But we both know that it, that it happened. And that reward of truly helping your your fellow human right. uh, <coughs> get through that, in, in if politics is related to that, you know, those are important things. And so I think I think that's a, a, a motivator. Mm-hmm. It's interesting when I ran for office the successful time. Uh-huh. <laughs> not, if you're going to be successful, be successful in the second, not the first, right? But uh, on, the, on the second time that I ran the successful time, I was knocking on doors and happened to knock on the door of the person who became my wife. Huh. And so I met my wife by going door to door, and we used to always joke that her mother would say, Mr. Wright's never going to knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, of course, that, she still says that to this day. <laughs> but that's how I met my wife. So I thought even if I had lost that 1992 election, I had already won right. because yeah. I, had mm-hmm. met, I had met my future wife. So we're, we'll celebrate 29 years oh, of marriage. Oh, congratulations. Nice. Yeah, and awesome. in, uh, the end of this year, December of uh, – so talking about winning elections, uh, I mean, 30 years, uh, was there any given time where you were so close uh, with one of your competitors or during a pri- I don't know if you ever had a primary or so uh, I've, a general? You know, it's interesting. I haven't had a close race okay. since, since the, the first and second one. Mm-hmm. However, running for office, um, especially when you're opposed, which I have been numerous, numerous times, uh-huh. uh, 2002 was probably the worst race for me. Uh, I had young children. Uh, it was severe. Um, you know, if you, if you started doing like they do, you know, hurricane categories, mm. this was a category five race. Okay, <laughs> and and so that was difficult. I think it aged me probably five years <laughs> going through that race. Incidentally, once that race was over, uh, the person who ran against me, uh, you know, it was a, a tough, tough race. I ended up getting sixty five percent of the vote. Mm. I mm. never would have guessed that. As a matter of fact, I had already in my mind, thought about my concession speech. You know, hmm. And so I, I was already playing that in my mind just in case <laughs> I had to do it. Uh, and uh, uh, so I was, I was, you know, dumbstruck, if you will, that, mm. that the, the margin was that much. But he and I have since become friends. And uh, the person that I defeated in 1992, when it was announced that I wouldn't be running again, actually called and said, please run one more time. <laughs> and I said, just so I have this straight, you tried to prevent me from being there, and now you don't want me to leave. <laughs> so we had a good we had a good laugh out of so, that. But that's community right. more yeah. than it is if, if you seek what unites you more than what divides you. Right. Uh, right. And again, that's that's part of that learning circumspect um, that that I hope more and more of us will. will right. So let's just stuff. come a little closer to what's happening now. Sure. Uh, Gary, what, what what is it with the current politician? Not taking sides with any political party. What's up with? Suddenly, people don't want to concede if they lose an election. What's up with that? 
well, what's up with it is unfortunate. Uh-huh. Um, and, and that is anytime you have distrust or doubt within the system that operates, mm-hmm. uh, that is reason for pause or mm-hmm. concern. Mm-hmm. I think the difficulty we have today is that people tend to live in their own echo chamber. Uh, if mm-hmm. you look at social media mm-hmm. or what group you're in. Mm-hmm. And so if if you're in if we are only in our own little version of the world, Correct. then we start thinking everybody thinks like we do. Mm-hmm. And that probably is not the case. Mm-hmm. And so if you lose an election, there's no way you could have lost it because everybody you knew thought like you and was voting for you, right. it must be rigged. Right. And so the only, you know, they used to talk about negative campaigning versus positive and which one works. So if someone thinks you're a crook and somebody else calls you that, it affirms or confirms what they were already thinking. In that case, the negative spin works. If they call you a crook, but your neighbors think you're an honest person, they think that person's lying about you because mm. they, they know Aggie's a great guy. Right. Okay, And so that's, that's the difference between those two. And I think in today's climate, there is so much yelling and there is very little listening. Mm. And there is so mm. much, I'll call it self satisfaction in look at me it goes back to the swimmer right the splasher yeah i was gonna say and and so so we're living in in and again social media has a lot of good points Uh, i think the technology is great but it also has some negatives and those negatives deal with you know we call them keyboard thugs that people that that get into um real meanness Mm -hmm. And I, I go to Rock Hill Eats on Facebook, and I'm like, who who are these people, hmm. mm-hmm. you know, that, that are going to burn the house down because they didn't get pickles on their hamburger? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and But it's unfortunate that we live in that world, but that is part of uh, the, the political fabric, unfortunately, today that we live in. Hmm. Um, you know, for me, when I was elected, very few Republicans in Rock Hill, and today I'm called a rhino, you know, <laughs> and a Republican in name only, and hmm. I thought, really, my stance on issues from 1991, 92 to 2021, 20, 22 have not changed. Right. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's obviously the, the, the marker has changed. And so, and the culture has changed. And so th- those things you have to deal with. It's, it's interesting because I felt a, a nudging, a calling to get into office. I felt the same nudging and calling to leave Mm. and so there was a there was a time stamp there was a time to get in there was a time to get out fortunately i got to choose both right um it wasn't chosen for me (laughs) as it is with (laughs) right with some people but but the negative uh aspects of politics today of being distrustful at all cost i think is a negative reflection on the process it's a negative reflection on the country I do have hope, as we all know, the pendulum always swings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So historically, if you start looking back at, you know, how campaigns were run. So when the pandemic hit in 2020, um, I started going back and reading history 100 years prior mm-hmm. every week. And it was eye opening for me. I actually had to go back to 1918 because I wanted to pick up the Spanish flu, right. mm-hmm. which really the came pandemic, from our yeah. soldiers coming home from World War I, 1917, mm-hmm. 1918. Mm-hmm. Woodrow Wilson is president. He's termed out in 1920. Uh, Warren Harding is elected. It's, it's interesting that Warren Harding's campaign theme was return to normalcy. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that was that was the campaign theme then. And of course, Warren Harding um, issued in what do we what do we know the twenties as the Roaring Twenties, mm-hmm. right. and so there w- there was a spirit of renewal, revival, entrepreneurship, uh, industrial growth, automobile growth in this country, and then of course we know what happened toward the end of the twenties uh, with the stock market, and so um, you know. We're not to 2029 yet, so I don't know, I don't know what I don't know what the portendings are. Right. But but it's interesting to go back and look at history yeah. to kind of figure out what was happening, how things were done, and I, it, it's you know they say always study history so that you don't repeat at mm-hmm. least the negative parts of it. You right. don't want to yeah. repeat the positive parts of it. But those are the things that I started studying, and it's just been eye opening to me. 
but the political side of things, if if we focus on people and relationships versus the politics of it, we're much better off. Um, serving in, in Columbia when I became the majority leader, it put me back into a partisan position mm. uh, because obviously we were the Republicans, they were the Democrats, but I never treated it like that. And I knew I was going into some maybe uncharted territory uh, because part of my role is that, but I always let my minority leader, Todd Rutherford from Columbia, know what we were doing hmm. in the macro. I didn't give him specifics, but I, I told him I'll never surprise you. Hmm. You know, we won't come, we won't spring something on you. And he and I developed probably one of the best relationships. As a matter of fact, prior to me leaving, um, he stood on the floor of the house and made a speech about me. Hmm. And it was, I mean, almost bring tears just because it w it showed what can happen if you put relationships and policy above politics. Mm -hmm. And South Carolina continues to do that. We are not Washington. I think if you look at Washington, from any vantage point, you would have to say it's broken. And it's broken because we talked about the echo chamber, but really the bell-shaped curve is scientific. And so the ends of the bell-shaped curve, left and right, are trying to pretend or act as if they are the middle and mm -hmm. they are not the middle. And it, it causes that strain in that system of process and that becomes very difficult. It's difficult to navigate and once you have drawn lines in the sand that are that deep, right, right, it's right. difficult to retreat back to say, hey, let's work this out. And, and again, Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, who was one of my political heroes, if you go back to the early 80s, Republican president, Democrat Congress, both Senate and House, mm -hmm. but he would have bourbon. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the boiled peanuts, but <laughs> he, would have, he would have bourbon in the afternoons with yeah. Tip O'Neill, mm -hmm. who was a Speaker of the House then, who was a solid Democrat, I mean, a, a liberal Democrat, as, right. they, as they would say in the day. Mm -hmm. But they forged policy through relationship and through communication. And I've always said in Columbia, kind of my mantra has become, it's a C mantra. And I said, C's are good for me because that was my favorite grade in school typically. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's commitment and communication. Right. And the, the two of those C's lead to the trifecta C uh, and that's consensus. Right. So people talk about compromise. In reality, in politics, if you'll focus more on consensus versus compromise, compromise leaves both sides mm, a little addled. Mm -hmm. But consensus is say, we both want to go to the beach. You want to take the back roads. I want to take the interstate. Knowing the goal of where we're trying to get to, the best way to do that and how we can work together. Because whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent in South Carolina, those that serve with me, I know they also love South Carolina. Mm -hmm. They also are committed to their constituency. And so it's not I'm right, they're wrong. That's exactly the point. We, yep. we, we, yep. we have mm -hmm. differing views on how, how right. to get to where right. we're going. And, and, to, to be, and again, but it takes respect. You have to respect something that you don't agree with. And sometimes for, for many people, that is a, a difficult transition, mm -hmm. especially if you're listening to the, the, the noise that, right. that surrounds you of the yelling and the violence and those things that, that come yeah. from, right. mm -hmm. from those conversations. People always ask me, like friends from here, from Rock Hill. I've lived in Rock Hill now 17 years now, so like, oh, Aggie, you should run for office. I said, no, no, no. Why not? Uh, I don't want any of my past to come out. Well, the good news <laughs> about running for office today, right. whether it's true or not, if you run for office, if you want to know your skeletons, yeah. they will definitely drag down. <laughs> Some of the skeletons are from your neighbor's closet. But what's that got to do? <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, that's a. Uh, if you, I think now going moving forward, if you want to be in politics, if you want to get into politics from from the age of I guess eighteen, you better live an absolute Just clean, stick and span, <laughs> pick and span <laughs> life yeah. because it's going to be impossible. Well, saying I'm pre social media, <laughs> so I mean, think think about the folks today that are on TikTok or Yik right. Yak or well, whatever they're on, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> right, and and having the permanency yep. of of those things happening. Yep. To them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So all right, let's um, switch away from politics for a second. Let's get to the next politics, which is most uh, 
an interesting topic for us for months, just looking at that picture. So as we have a little uh, post-it note. That's a, a rendering there. I, I, the, I know what the rendering yeah. is. Okay, you may, you may be familiar. You yeah. may have seen it a time or two. Yeah, the well. Panther, Panther's training facility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we still have a little. Uh, so we went and bought a bunch of stuff when that company, uh, the, the, the architect, contractor, the contractor yeah, yeah. went out of uh, file for bankruptcy. They were getting, selling all this stuff. We bought some desks and, you know, coffee parts and stuff like that. So we ended up buying that. So the what ifs and could have beens of, of society. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So you were involved <laughs> in that pretty heavily, wasn't Somewhat. you? Yeah. <laughs> Somewhat. Yeah. Since it's Any, all uh, kind of or <laughs> and you said and done, what is your, what, what's your thought on that? Uh, yeah. Disappointing. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, so, so we had an opportunity in South Carolina. I mean, I always think of South Carolina, we, we think of football, college football. Oh, yeah. Rock yeah. Hill is actually known as football, football city, town, yeah. USA. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but we're one state and two teams. That's Clemson and Carolina. In this instance, with the Carolina Panthers, and of course, it, it is derived out of South Carolina. That's Jerry Richardson. So we're, we're two states and one team. Mm-hmm. And so when David Tepper purchased the Carolina Panthers, um, people were excited. You know, they were excited about the opportunities of, of what his dreams and goals were. Uh, and then you start looking at his his ideas of either comparing it back to, say, the Dallas Cowboys and right. and, the, and what, what they have in Texas to the have star, something yeah. mm-hmm. like that that would be in our area. And then for South Carolina and Rock Hill to be in contention for that cachet. And so we started meeting with the Carolina Panthers, um, actually Mayor Geddes and I, back in October 2018, hmm. and in earnest about the possibilities. Well, as we looked at you know, what, what would be required, mm-hmm. obviously they needed a large footprint of property, but they also needed changes in the law. Uh, because it's interesting if you start looking at job development credit or economic development credits, those things, if they were Tepper insurance conglomerate or Tepper manufacturing, they qualify for all of that. But the fact that you're a pro sports team, you don't qualify for the same benefits. And so we had I know to, that very personally, Gary. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> so so we so we had to change the law. Right. And so that was my bill. Uh, I, I actually got um, David Tepper and Governor McMaster together. We had a breakfast at the at the governor's mansion. It was a great event, talking about the possibilities of of what this looked like. Uh, introduced the bill. We got it through the House pretty quickly. Um, in the Senate, it ran into some problems, and and you got to realize that the difficulty with that was the fact that a person who is a billionaire, so he he became a target personally versus the cachet of what it would bring to uh, mm-hmm. Rock Hill and, and really to the Southeast for that matter. Mm-hmm. But we, we worked to, to get that through. Um, it, it took a lot of political juggling uh, mm-hmm. to make that happen. We had a limited time. We were a part-time legislature. We had to have it done by the third Thursday in May at 5 o'clock. It was sealed at about 4.48 mm-hmm. that afternoon. Mm-hmm. So it, it, I can go into more detail sometime about how that worked, um, but, but it took some doing. It was not, it was not uh, a hands-off affair. Mm-hmm. It, was, <laughs> it, was, it was raw politics, but we got it done. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, as you know, we, we had the, uh, the, not the groundbreaking, but the big announcement down right. at Fountain Park in, in Rock Hill. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, of course, part of that – uh, was having an interchange to the property, the Hutchison property that became the property that, that Mr. Tepper had purchased. And so as we rolled forward, of course, pandemic now hits us. So costs of everything has either gone up or you're having a difficulty, you know, getting uh, personnel to, to actually work and make these things happen. But as the deal unraveled mm. uh, here in Rock Hill, you know, the question became, you know, what could you have done differently? And I don't know that there's really any one thing that could been have been done differently. What I do know, and, and a media person asked me this in Columbia, and my response was, no regrets. And I remember being taken to task on social media about that comment, but I stood by it. And the reason I said no regrets is because South Carolina now has in its books – in law, that a pro sports team can come to this state. Hmm. So we we are we are a welcome. You know, today in Greer uh, was announced 
the largest economic development deal in the history of South Carolina. $1.7 billion deal. So South Carolina is open for business. Not every venture is successful, mm. but if you look at South Carolina's track record, we do very well. South Carolina has grown. We're now 5.2 million people. And so that growth being there, the success being there, the continued job development growth being there, this is one that is a disappointment, but not a regret. And so I say that to look forward that an interchange coming into that that area in most cases aggie when economic development comes everything ancillary to it plays catch up so you you announce the economic development the growth comes you don't have the water the sewer the broadband you don't have the infrastructure meaning roads and bridges in this case, for whatever that property becomes, mm -hmm. 240 acres, the infrastructure is already there. Already Tell there. me <clears> another <throat> place in South Carolina or anywhere for that matter where the infrastructure was done first and the economic development was done second. Again, wasn't planned that way, but certainly through this, I think the positive aspect of, of what we will see come mm. uh, for Rock Hill. I always go back to a, a Henry Wadsworth Longfellow mm. quote is don't deem the irrevocable past is wholly wasted or wholly vain if rising upon its wrecks at last is something nobler we attain. And so I look at that site and I think we will attain something nobler right. for our community. We are a resilient community. And while you may look at this as a setback, unfortunately so, and a disappointment, it is not the end. It is the beginning right. of something. Big. So what, what would you like to see there? I know we, the, this is gone now. So what would you like to see? Like if it was your, your choice to care, this is what I would like to see. What would it's that our be? king for a day. <laughs> sure. uh, I, I would like to see a, a, a mix, a, a mix, if, almost like a Kingsley. If you go uh -huh. up and look at Kingsley yeah. where you've yeah. got a mix of um, housing, you've got a mix of restaurants and retail uh, and business, you know, in, in the area and, and Remember this, too. You've been here 17 years, you said. So Rock Hill has been, you know, under the shadow of Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Fort Mill was a was a very small community. Right. If you'd have said 10 years ago, 15 years ago, hey, in 2022, the Fort Mill School District will be bigger than the Rock Hill School District. Mm -hmm. You'd have lost whatever <laughs> wager you had. Well, today, <laughs> it is true. Fort Mill School District is bigger than the Rock Hill School District, more populous. So things change sometimes beyond what we could even imagine. Mm. But I do know this, that when, when Charlotte is kind of the big oak tree uh, over Rock Hill, you know, two things happen if you're trying to grow grass under an oak tree. One, the oak tree shades the sun. The second, it sucks the nutrients out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So Rock Hill turn to sports tourism, destination sports tourism, and we did it beginning with Cherry Park. And Cherry Park was very controversial uh, when it was first had the idea and it was developed. As a matter of fact, Doug Eccles was the city council member who represented that area and he supported Cherry Park. He was defeated in the next election because he supported Cherry Park. Hmm. Well, as we know, Later on, he came back to become mayor and serve for 20 years because right. people were able to see, you know, he was actually on to something. Well, the, the Cherry Park and softball led us to soccer fields mm -hmm. and led us to disc golf, international disc golf. The 24th year hosted mm -hmm. at Winthrop University here mm -hmm. in Rock Hill. And the velodrome, BMX. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at what that draws for us. So we, we have made the effort and successfully so, not to be a bedroom community to Charlotte, mm. but to be our own hub. Right. And we've done that through attracting business here, industry here, and great way of life. And so I think you, you can shine even in the shadow of a large place like Charlotte. And Rock Hill has has proven that that is, that is a way that we can do it. And so I look at this as the next extension of the growth along the interstate. This is over a mile hmm. of interstate highway mm -hmm. frontage, yeah. uh, frontage. Yep. And, and, and with its own 
uh, overpass and interchange coming in that connects it not only to I-77, but back to Mount Gallant Road, Mm -hmm. to Eden Terrace, to Cell River Road, and of course right over into Riverwalk Mm -hmm. and 21. And so Mm -hmm. the the connectivity for what this area is, I think is, is fantastic. Awesome. So Charles, should we take a break, drink, eat some peanuts, Let's do drink it. some do bourbon, <laughs> and then talk about other stuff? We'll be right back, yeah. Did you know that the IRS now requires all tax-exempt organizations to e-file their 990 tax forms? If you need to file a 990, check out expresstaxexempt.com, the quickest and easiest way to e-file your organization's 990 forms. Express Tax Exempt offers interview style and form-based processes to accommodate 990 experts and newcomers alike. Plus, they make it easy to attach any required schedules, share the return with others in your organization for review, and they even offer live customer support. So go to expresstaxexempt.com now for the easiest 990 e-filing option. And we're back. Let's talk about the peanuts, Charles. So we got some boiled peanuts here. Do you so approve? So tell us that. Why do you I do. I do. Look, a little You're spice. A little what, spice. What's the recipe, Charles? Charles is excellent. Yeah. Uh, so it's you got to have salt. That's this kind of the go-to. It's just salt and water. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, added a bit of Old Bay, some red pepper flakes. I put in some coriander and mm. just kind of whole black pepper as well. What? Just floating around in there. So look at yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. You become a dad, and then you're becoming all sensible with like good <laughs> snacks and stuff, Charles. He just recently became a dad. Oh, congratulations, yeah. Yeah, it's Charles! Exciting time, exciting time. Six, uh, eight months ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow, it's been eight months. Eight months. Time wow. Flies. Time Dang, flies. look at that. Yeah. I've known Charles twelve years now. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Twelve time years flies. Wow. Um, so we were just discovering over the break. You guys are both pilots. I, we didn't realize that you were. Uh, you That's were what a pilot I was missing yet. for the last uh, few. Podcast, yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not. I'm just not one anymore. So. <laughs> so, so, I, I've, I've passed the torch. What, what made it give up? Uh, the expense and the scheduling uh-huh. of, of of that. So right. it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. It used, people would think, "Gosh, you know, I'm I'm going to learn to fly so I can you know travel these different places." Yeah. And if you're uh, in my field. That was more and more difficult. You, mm. Weather controlled you. You didn't control the weather, right? Uh, and so it was. It was more difficult. And it's an expensive hobby, right? You know. And, and if if you're going to Columbia, by the time you would do your get to the airport, do your checks, get in the plane, fly to Columbia, mm-hmm. get someone to pick you up, or you know, get to the state house, mm-hmm. right? The hour was up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> could have yeah. been there. Gotcha. By you could have driven there. By <laughs> yeah. the okay. right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Gotcha. Cool. All right. Now, so what's next for you? It looks like you've, you've accepted a new role at Winthrop. You're in the working in the office of the president. What's your official title there? I'm a special assistant uh, to the president for community engagement. And okay. so it's interesting because Winthrop's my alma mater. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is the first time with our new president, Edward Cerna, 12th president at Winthrop, that we've had an alum mm. as president. And so that, that's huh. an exciting that's time. Yeah. Uh, he is a great fit for uh, Winthrop. He has uh, a degree from Winthrop, as I said, being the alum. He's a non-traditional student, so was in business world, went back into higher ed, got his degree from Winthrop, hmm. uh, then received another degree from Clemson, and then from uh, Auburn, and then his doctorate from University of Alabama. And so, you know, four, four degrees for him. And great being back in Rock Hill, uh, at my alma mater, I, you know, I've said I, I love Rock Hill. I, I enjoyed serving the community of Rock Hill. I love Winthrop. I was a major in business, and so, you know, people. Some people have good experiences in college. Some yeah. people don't. I worked my way through college, so it took me a little longer to get through. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't really realize, I guess, at the time that you could get a student loan, so I paid my <laughs> way through. Later, I was thankful for that. But the business school that I was in it went through during my years there was exciting the professors were extremely helpful extremely caring they wanted you to be successful you weren't just a number uh, you were a person and so that for me has great memories so the fact that i can come back and promote the very institution that, nice. that helped shape me in my younger years and prepared me for life is definitely a plus i love south carolina 
uh, it's the best state in the best country in the world, period. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll, I'll fight for that every day. It's a great place to call home. And so just to have that series of events happen in my life, mostly unplanned. Uh, for me, it was more of a stumble than, than a walk <laughs> uh, for what I did. But uh, I'm very grateful, grateful to the community. I mean, again, in, when you're in office, you have to be approved every two years mm. uh, to continue doing your role. So yeah. your resume is out there. Uh, your your job qualifications are out there. And the test for you to either stay or go is yeah. out there. So I'm very grateful for, for the community of allowing me the, the privilege of representing them. So how did this come about? Were, were you not going to be um, in politics anymore because of the new position or the po uh, you were? No. I, as, <coughs> I, as I said earlier, I... I I felt a calling to get into politics. Mm -hmm. I really did, and that that goes back, um, you know, to not only my volunteering with Ronald Reagan's campaign in 1980, but really prior to that, eighth grade civics class. We called it social studies back then, but uh -huh. but uh, we we visited Columbia, and I even remember then being in the House and the Senate. We even visited the governor's mansion, and the House just seemed to be active. And I thought I would love to serve here one day, but it was one of those dreams that you can kind of barely see but it's not something that you think gosh you know that could happen right because i thought who am i to think something like that mm. right. and and so I, i never really followed up on that later on you know when when the time happened and that seat opened up is when it hit me i thought wow you know right. what i had thought about not that many years ago mm -hmm. i have an opportunity uh to actually do that and i and i did i did feel the, the nudge but I, i felt the same nudge getting out of politics it was just time and I, i look back at some things that you know i was able to accomplish in columbia again for my community and those were important um mile markers i look at it these are just funny turns of events so in 2014 um you know people were complaining about the roads in south carolina you know we're growing we're growing economy, we're a growing population, and the roads are terrible. Mm -hmm. But we're one of the lowest gas tax states in the union, yet we have the fourth largest network of roads that are state-owned in the nation. Mm -hmm. Little mm -hmm. South Carolina, I said, why would that be? Mm -hmm. So the Speaker of the House set up a special committee to study road funding and a better way to pay for infrastructure in South Carolina. He appointed the Speaker Pro Tem to head up this particular committee. Uh, he put me on the committee. Well, incidentally, the Speaker ended up being indicted on charges, mm -hmm. and so the Speaker Pro Tem became the acting Speaker. So he put me in charge of the Infrastructure huh. Committee. And so we studied this thing for hours and hours and hours, testimony-based of What's the best way? How do you pay for uh, infrastructure in South Carolina? What's, what's the most economical way to make this happen? And so through all of that, the, the thing that I did not want to do was raise the gas tax. I, hmm. I thought, you know, we needed to reform within DOT. We needed to make sure that, that we were spending every dollar wisely. We needed to make sure there were audits within the system. And we did all that. So, so we created this system. At the end of the day, I also realized you've got to pay in order to receive. And, and so you had to do that. <clears throat> and so we ended up implementing a plan where we increased the gas tax two pennies over six years for a 12 penny total uh, price increase. That began in July of 2017. And the last penny, of course, kicked in uh, just recently. And so th those years are now up for us in, in improving our roads, and it is happening. It's finally happening in South Carolina. Yeah. And so as you see those things come about, you realize that wasn't something I planned to be in the middle of that, <clears throat> but it was something that worked out. And at the end of the day, here I was leading a tax increase mm. as the majority leader as a Republican in South Carolina. <laughs> right. And so what, what odd combination <laughs> are all of those pieces, but here's something that, that we ended up doing as part of this plan, because as you see the cars become more and more efficient, whether it's an EV car or a um, hybrid car, cars becoming more efficient, but they're still using the same amount of roads. Well, how do we pay for 
infrastructure from a road perspective. It's volume of fuel sold. The more gallons you sell, the more taxes collected, the more roads you can pave. Well, as cars become more efficient, whether it's through the CAFE standard or the others we just mentioned of the EV and the hybrid, you have to have a value component. And so we added a value component. And the value component was taking the sales tax derived from vehicles and applying it straight to the Department of Transportation. And so we had value and we had volume. Mm. Well, when the pandemic hit in 2020, that second quarter, <laughs> fuel tax receipts were down about 38% in South Carolina because people weren't traveling. Right. At the same time, people started buying cars and trucks mm. and boats and motorcycles mm -hmm. like there was no tomorrow. Right. <laughs> and so those revenues rose while the fuel tax revenue dropped, which kept us even. So a lot of states during this pandemic time lost steam because they couldn't bond for roads because they didn't have the income coming in to pay for it. Right. That was not the case in South Carolina. So another good piece of that puzzle that happened was that other states could not draw down federal dollars because they didn't have the match. Mm. We had the match. And so we ended up with another $1 billion in federal match dollars that came to South Carolina because we had done the mix right. of our portfolio right. mm -hmm. of how you pay for taxes or how you pay for roads through the fuel tax in South Carolina. And, and that made a huge difference. Interestingly enough, we talked about history a little bit ago. <clears throat> I love history. So I'll go back. I said, where did the first gas tax come from? I mean, we didn't have cars, right, at the turn of the century, barely, horse and buggy. So where did the first gas tax come from? It was Herbert Hoover, a hmm. Republican president. Who, who increased it after Herbert Hoover? Dwight D. Eisenhower. That was for the interstate highway system. Mm -hmm. And that was really a safety measure, not an ease of travel measure. Because right. he wanted to make sure if we were attacked, we had the ability to move, move right. transport yeah. and tanks and aircraft around our country. The third person to come along and increase the gas tax, Ronald Reagan <laughs> in the early 1980s. <laughs> and this is the person people hold up today <laughs> as, you know, M guy. Mr. Conservative who would not raise a tax, and he <laughs> right. did. He signed, he signed into law uh, the, the, the gas tax. And then, of course, Governor Carol Campbell in South Carolina, it was 1987, 35 years ago, in order to lure BMW to the upstate, we needed infrastructure money. So we were taxing at the time 13.75 cents per gallon. He asked for a nickel to take it to 18.75. Republican governor now, Aggie. Mm. And he had a Democrat House and a Democrat Senate. They said, a nickel's too much, sir. Mm. They, <laughs> they compromised with him at three pennies. So oh, okay. 16.75. So Today we're 28.75. Right. When is uh, the road that take off and Mount Gallon Road getting fixed then? <laughs> I don't know the details of all the roads, but, but I will tell you this. So here's the good news. Um, with that increase, we also increase commensurate with that C fund dollars, mm -hmm. which are local county dollars <coughs> that come back that your that your local county council is in control of. Mm -hmm. And so that's more money back to our local communities. And so someone asked me what time, what does a C in C fund, I said, well, it's just not A and it's not B. <laughs> it's, it's farm to, rock, farm to market uh, dollars for roads, but the C doesn't mean anything other than it's not A or B. Gotcha. So during our break, you said uh, you are a car collector. What kind of cars you collect? What's the interest? Where did the interest come from? I know you are in that business. So. So I'm folding out of that business now, mm -hmm. but yeah, so so I have loved cars since the first day I could breathe. Uh -huh. uh, I think my first word was Cadillac uh, <laughs> when, I, when, I was a young, when I was a young lad, but I have always loved cars. And so um, I was in the moving and storage business, and when 2001 September happened, uh, September 11th, uh, that day struck me because as I watched video footage of people walking into the towers or just into work and they weren't coming back out and it taught me the fragility of life just watching it on television at the time i was 35 years old and i thought you know i want to do what my passion is mm. not what pays and i always love cars and so i decided to get into the car business and September 11th happened. I got my dealer's license October 8th. 
hmm. uh, of that same year. And so I started into the, to the car business because it was a, an avocation for me. I turned it into a vocation. So I've always collected cars. I've collected hundreds of cars and sold them over the years. Some I have regrets. But currently in my collection, I have a 1940 Cadillac Series 60 sedan. Hmm. Uh, so leave the gun, take the cannoli. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I have a 1984 <coughs> yeah. Porsche Carrera uh-huh. uh, Coupe. Uh, I have a 1985 Mercedes 380 SL. I have a 1988 Rolls-Royce Corniche II uh, convertible. Hmm. Uh, and I have a 1979 Mercedes-Benz 6.9 okay. sedan. So th- those, are, those are the collector cars nice. at this time. I also have a 2018 Porsche Targa 4S, okay. uh, which is a very rare, it, a very yeah, rare yeah, car. Yeah. Yeah. And I just I had a 22 Corvette uh, 3LT. Z51 convertible. I just sold it. Okay. So. Oh right on. We have to so. do our next podcast from your car. <laughs> <laughs> we'll compete with so. Jerry Seinfeld on that. <clears throat> so we, um, I traded my Tesla for a Ram 1500 three years ago. Welcome to South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and I, thank you for I, helping pay for the road. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hated that Tesla, but I'm, I'm so happy with my truck. I love it. Uh, it's a great truck. I, I really, really enjoy it. But as uh, as part of that, the dealership that I bought it from in uh, in Lincolnton, uh, Abernathy, Abernathy mm-hmm. uh, Ram Jeep Dodge, mm-hmm. became really good friends with the people who own it and all that good stuff. So we bought two trucks and two Jeeps and other vehicles, about seven or eight vehicles. So when I found out, uh, twenty twenty three is the final year, final call for the Challenger and the Charger, and they're having special badge for final call. Um, and uh, they are producing all of them and shipping it to the dealers and you just have to deal with the dealers to buy it and that's it the last year so i called called him <clears throat> two weeks ago i said mike whatever is the biggest fastest one you go, you're going to oh. get for your selection for for your uh, dealership i want it <laughs> 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 he goes is there any limit on the budget i said no just give me the fastest one you're gonna get um and he goes, okay. So they're going to open it up on November 1st um, where the dealership will know what are they getting allocated huh. um, for the challenge, the final call Challenger and the Dodger, uh, Chargers. So he's going to say, as soon as I find out, dude, I'll call you. And I'm pretty <laughs> wow. excited about it. So I only have a one midlife crisis car. I sell 63 AMG. Um, so, but great, I haven't driven that. Car. Yeah, I haven't driven that in probably two months. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, be well, careful with that one. <laughs> yeah, when you said, uh, I'm getting rid of it because I don't drive it, I didn't realize you were replacing it with the <laughs> <laughs> so, another one. So now, how often do you get to drive all your cars? Or do you drive them or you just... Uh, uh, last Sunday, I took the rolls out. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. <laughs> where, do, all, where do you go in Rockdale? Just around, just around Cherry Road, Oakland uh-huh. Avenue. I was out of group, Grey Poupon, so I had to stop and get <laughs> <laughs> a bottle of <laughs> Tell on that note, hit me up, man. <laughs> oh, that's, that's funny. Uh, but do you said you, um, you you had hundreds of them and you buy them, sell them. Like, what what triggers you to say, okay, I'm gonna. It's time for for me to let this one go. That's um, good. Thanks. I, that is a great question, and I have a, probably a terrible answer. So, when I don't drive it as much, I said it's time to sell it. But I have some regrets. I sold a um, a 1998 Porsche. Carrera 4S. Turns out it was owned by Gillian Anderson. Oh. And, and from the X Files. And Caleb, I, do you know I who that sh- is? I don't. I, sh- I mean, X Files, but I should have. I should have kept that car. Right. Uh, regret. Um, I had a 1972 BMW 30 CSI. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Should have kept that car. And then I had a 1979 BMW 320i Iberian Red. Uh huh. Thirty one thousand original miles on it. Wow. I should have kept that. Right. Car. Mm-hmm. So I, I go back and I have regrets. But let me tell you what. I, here, here's here's my remedy. <laughs> so I've been buying vintage car ads, mm-hmm. and I buy the cheap frame. You know, the little black frame you can buy. Huh. And I have a gallery now of huh. all these cars, so I can stop and I can reminisce about what was and I don't have to pay taxes. I don't, have to, <laughs> I don't have to charge the battery. I don't have to put fuel in it. I don't have to pay insurance. Uh-huh. But I get some of the same you know, joy. Nice. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. How, do you, how do you get past uh, permission from your wife to buy these toys? <laughs> I have probably the best wife in the world. Uh-huh. And uh, she says, if, if you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> when I decide to buy something, um, like one of these gadgets or toys, she, she goes, why even are you asking me? Like, you're going to 
not buy because I said no. You just just for the sake of stuff, <laughs> you're just throwing it out there. Uh, I'm thinking about buying this thing. It's a it's a waste of conversation. You're still gonna do it anyway. So. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. <laughs> and, and the key is to keep your wife in a nice car, <laughs> right? So that she, you know, that she's happy. Yeah, I I asked my wife what kind of car you want, and she wanted a Honda Accord, her best favorite car. And she goes, I so said, you right. have a great wife too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, if that's what you want, sure, I'll get you one. So she loves that car. Um, so, but here's the next part of that. Now, when you, um, I watch those TV shows, make them car auctions and all oh, that yeah. stuff. Have you been to one of them? Have you I haven't uh, been to one. I've uh-huh. watched them all. I, a little out of my league. Okay. Uh, but I, but, but I, how do you how do you find what what is your next car that you want to buy? Oh, it happens to me. I don't I don't okay. I don't look okay. for it. Right. Uh, something comes my way. So uh-huh. so the Rolls-Royce um, was out of Hilton Head, actually Lemon Island, South Carolina near between Beaufort and Hilton Head. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was the Hargrave Telephone Company of that area. Uh, uh-huh. this was uh, well, the heiress, really, of Hargrave Telephone Company, super nice mm-hmm. family. Uh, sh- she was selling this collection, mm-hmm. and a friend of mine called and said, "Hey, you ought to go go look at this car. This is mm-hmm. a Rolls Royce with twenty three thousand original miles." On wow! It. <laughs> yeah, just just an absolute cotillion white, uh-huh. and nice. beautiful, beautiful car. Do you wow. get nervous driving that around? No, I used to get nervous driving around. I, I've had some Ferraris. I've had a Lamborghini. Uh, I got more nervous about them because everybody wants to look at it. Right. And people have belt buckles and right. they want to lean over the car. Uh-huh. And that makes me a little nervous. And then yeah. if you stop at a restaurant, you know people are You're salivating kidding. over it. And yeah. I can't enjoy my meal for yeah. thinking about it. <laughs> so so it, and that, that part's no good. Uh, I, for my SL63, it's, it's a factory matte finish. Oh, yeah. So I'm scared of getting a scratch. There's one scratch on it when I bought it. So every time I put a cover on and take the cover back, I was like, oh, oh you're just going to scratch it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bought a car recently, a 2017 Corvette with 4,300 miles on it. And when I picked it up, the gentleman said it had never been in the rain. I believe him to be telling the absolute truth. <laughs> it had mats on top of mats. Uh-huh. And it had a cover over the console so his elbow didn't hit Uh and then he had plastic sheaths made for the seals inside the door so Uh he did not (laughs) scuff them and i got to thinking he never enjoyed that (laughs) he he worshipped it but he never enjoyed it (laughs) you probably know one of my neighbor uh he drives a mercedes um sl not the 60 the the other version it's white with red interior and um, he's in his eight, early 80s, and he loves that car. He drives it around. Uh, every time he drives that, he wears like a like a cowboy hat on, <laughs> and he wears gloves. And but he wears a lot of jewelry. So his armrest or the driver's side door is all scratched up. That one area, it's about yeah. two inch thick. That's scratched. But he always drives it um, leather gloves. So why do you drive it leather gloves? Because I don't want any of my natural oils get on the leather or the steering wheel. I said, what about your car? <laughs> he goes, I still have to wear jewelry. <laughs> 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 to each his own. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So now, obviously, now you, uh, you're out of politics. I'm assuming you're going to have more free time. What are the other hobbies you Well, have? the difference is 1.3 miles from my office versus 75 miles from right. my office. So that makes a little <laughs> bit of a difference right. yeah. uh, for me. And I, I, I would never refer to it as, as free time. It's just time spent differently mm. uh, in, in what I do. But I'm still engaged in the community. Um, and so I, I never want to give that up. You know, I, I have been invited to be a part of, you know, many different ventures mm. within the community. And so I'm, I'm weighing all of that now. I served for six years on the Piedmont Medical Board while I was in office. I'm finishing a term, actually three terms, at Camp Canaan. Mm. Uh, mm. I'm on their board. And so other some other entities have reached out mm. uh, to, to serve on their board. And so I'm, I'm weighing all of that. I think at the end of the day, you know, talk, somebody says, you know, what is one word that describes you? And I don't know that I want anybody talking about that one word that maybe describes me, <laughs> but the word that comes to mind for me that I would like to describe myself with, and that is useful, mm. that I'm still useful in some facet uh, of being able to, to help my community. And I think that's at the end of the day for me in in Rock Hill being the good town, right? Uh, that that would be the mantra 
that, that I would hang my hat on. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, I, I appreciate uh, you all having me. I mean, it, it's, it's good to talk within the community. Uh, Rock Hill is so vibrant. And to have, you know, you all here doing what you're doing. I always, as I ride down the road, I, I look at, I love cars. So I look <laughs> at the cars and the people in the cars. And I think, what, what do all these people do for a living? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, what's going on in their world? What are they thinking? What are they doing? And for Rock Hill to have... Oh. The complexity of different talent uh, in this town is remarkable to me uh, because I often think, you know, Rocky, who who would purposely come here? (laughs) And I I came here by birth at at York General Hospital, but I chose to stay because I love this community. And the more people I meet, they say, when I got to Rock Hill, I came and I always ask, you know, how'd you get here? And once they tell me, they said, but now that I'm here, I'm here. You know, and I mm-hmm. think that speaks volumes to our community. Our mayor refers to it as the good town, mm-hmm. and I think we are the good town. And I think as we continue to grow and grow in a in a very uh, purposeful way of smart growth and what we offer back within mm-hmm. the community, you know, sometimes they say familiarity breeds contempt. That we don't realize as folks that have been here all of our lives mm-hmm. that that's what it is, but I recognize the beauty of, of this community. Right, yeah. And I'm glad, glad you do too. Yes, sir. We awesome. do. Well, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks so much. We really appreciate you having you on yeah. and uh, you. all your comments have been great. Yeah, Thanks we should so bring much. him back and talk some more about his cars and other stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. drink some more bourbon. Maybe, I'll bring, maybe he can bring peanuts next time. I'll bring the car, you bring the bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll show you the list I have. You pick one, I'll bring one. Meet, meet you at your garage next time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, awesome. thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us. Stick around next week and see what we talk about on The Bandit Room. Be sure to like, follow, comment, and subscribe. The Bandit Room is a production of Span Enterprises, located in sunny Rock Hill, South Carolina. We've been developing, supporting, and growing successful IRS e-filing and business management solutions since 2010. Go to spanenterprises.com now to learn more. The views and opinions expressed in The Bandit Room are those of the guests, and do not necessarily reflect or state the opinions of Span Enterprises. No information should be considered as tax, legal, or other professional advice.